Well, we'll get started here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this SHM webinar. We have a large group of people joining. Uh, we'll be doing some introductions of the moderators and the speakers shortly. Uh, we uh, want to welcome you all. Uh, this is a very interesting time um, we're in. We want to share knowledge, especially in this time of crisis that's going on worldwide. Uh, as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is, is bringing some rapidly evolving changes around us, and we want to really support each other through this offering um, of at least ultrasound in COVID-19 and the lessons learned. Uh, we have participants from all over the nation and several internationally joining this webinar. One more comment I would say, we have participants of uh, varying skill sets joining this webinar. Some are very, very experienced and use it, use bedside ultrasound on a daily basis. Some of you are in the middle and some of you are at the very beginning. And so we hope to cater this uh, webinar to all levels and hope you will take something uh, practical away uh, from this hour. This is being recorded. There is CME for those participating in the live uh, session here. A link will be sent to all participants uh, tomorrow to claim CME. If you have further questions during the presentation, we encourage you to use the chat box feature uh, and enter in the, into the question section on the control panel, uh, uh, usually on your right. SHM has a wide variety of resources for COVID-19. Uh, this webinar, uh, again, is being recorded and will be provided on this webpage. So take a look at the resources for clinicians uh, nationally, internationally as well. It's a growing list of resources that's available, publications, uh, videos, uh, uh, statements as well. For those interested in further training in ultrasound, SHM also has uh, additional resources. The certificate yeah. completion program is a good resource for those of you looking for additional training. Just simply Google SHM and point of care ultrasound, and you should be uh, having those early hits uh, in that sector as well. That transitions us to today. Uh, we are looking at uh, COVID-19 applications from hospitals uh, really on the front lines in New York City, Baltimore. We also have some special guests from Italy and uh, one from uh, Wuhan, China as well that'll be joining us. These are your moderators. I am uh, Benji Matthews. Um, my video is uh, not uh, working right now, but you can see me on the top right there. I serve as Chief of Hospital Medicine at Regents Hospital, part of the Health Partners Network in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, I'm the ultrasound, ultrasound Director um, uh, for Hospital Medicine and Health Partners, but also serve on the SHM National Ultrasound Steering Committee. My uh, co-chair uh, for the special interest group is the co-moderator. Uh, before I go there, you know, my, the outfit I'm wearing right now uh, on that uh, uh, screenshot there is from this last week when I was on a COVID unit and I was all uh, caped up there. But uh, Dr. Johnson, my co-moderator, has put a little laser pointer there. He added that to the handheld device I'm holding to turn me into a true Jedi warrior on the unit. There, right? uh, so on the top left is Dr. Uh, Gordy Johnson. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, uh, with our... Catholic and Christian colleagues, there is a lot of uh, there's uh, festivities going through the week here. There's Easter, there's Passover, a lot happening. So this is uh, from his Twitter account uh, that he's holding the, the ultrasound transducer there. Uh, Dr. Johnson serves as the lead of ultrasound at Legacy Health. He's on the, uh, uh, he also does a lot with the steer, steering committee and a lot of things with ultrasound with the publications around the nation. So today though, he's actually operating from 30,000 feet He's in. Uh, he's hidden in the uh, airplane there. He's actually calling in from 30,000 feet, and um, we thought he had such a fear of the virus, he decided to take the air where he felt he was more safe. Um, so, um, but actually, uh, jokes aside, he's actually doing a very noble thing here. He's actually leaving uh, Portland, where he's at, going to the front lines of New York City to serve there uh, and uh, probably use ultrasound there as well. So we'll have uh, Gordy join in maybe virtually if possible. Otherwise, I'll take it away for the moderator here. For our uh, panelists from the front lines, we, these are our panelists. Uh, Dr. Linda Kurian is on the top left there. She's Chief of Hospital Medicine at Long Island Jewish. She's in the midst of COVID crisis in New York. Uh, she was also on 60 Minutes on CBS recently with COVID. So we'll uh, hear from her uh, shortly as well. Uh, Dr. Gigi Liu is on the top right. She's a POCUS champion from Hopkins in Baltimore. She's all over Twitter as well, very active in, as a leader in her residency program. Uh, on your bottom left uh, and, and uh, bottom right, we have colleagues from uh, Cornell, and these are uh, Dr. Mintz and Dr. Wong, and they head the ultrasound program at Whale Cornell. And uh, they are also avid Twitter users, especially Dr. Mintz, as you can see on the bottom left there, 
Although he has 49 followers, he is following no one. <laughs> In the center, we have uh, Dr. Galen, and uh, he hails um, from uh, the East Coast as well. And uh, Dr. Galen is the director of ultrasound procedure training at Albert Einstein in New York City. Very active in ultrasound training with the residency program in Einstein Montefiore as well. So he'll be joining us shortly. Next, we have some of the speakers as well for today, and uh, they'll do some more introductions when they uh, are up. Dr. Sony is professor of medicine at University of Texas Health San Antonio, uh, also works with the VA uh, healthcare system there. He directs ultrasound uh, programming throughout SHM has multiple publications and is the author in, of the popular point of care ultrasound textbook. Uh, we welcome uh, from Torino, Italy, Dr. Giovanni Volpicelli. Uh, he's the Italian uh, lung ultrasound expert and worldwide, worldwide expert as well. Uh, he's Department of Emergency Medicine, Gonzaga U University Hospital there. And uh, hopefully we'll have Dr. Yao Shang from Wuhan, China. He is the key leader for ultrasound in China, uh, works with uh, critical care medicine there at Union Hospital. Um, and so we would welcome him. So with that, I'm just going to map our agenda for the hour here. We are planning to start with basic ultrasound uses in COVID-19 with Dr. Sony Volpicelli and Shang. We'll move on to a discussion of finding scene with our uh, frontline clinicians in New York City and Baltimore. And uh, if we have time, we'll leave some time for some themes from the Q&A and maybe some final tips from our speakers. So with that, I'll hand it off to Dr. Neelam Sony. Uh, take off the next uh, bit of the hour here. Dr. Sony. Thanks, Benji and Gordy for organizing. Um, this is a great group of people. So we've got Gordy Johnson on an airplane flying to New York to help the cause in New York City. We got uh, Giovanni Volpicelli on an ER shift in Italy right now at 3 a.m. And several of you on the East Coast after working a hard day who, who logged in and lots of you um, at home who joined us. So it's great to see that um, we all recognize it we're in this uh, together and we can help each other. So next slide, Benji. So we're gonna talk about a couple of practical applications of point of care ultrasound. This is a lot of material. And so I'm just gonna give a quick summary and I'm gonna give you a couple of resources where you can go if you really wanna review these topics um, and maybe specifically even for, for COVID-19. So what are some of the practical um, bread and butter uh, point of care ultrasound applications for use in COVID-19. Lung ultrasound for sure, this is a lung disease. Um, second, goal-directed echo, focused cardiac ultrasound, uh, limited echo, whatever you want to call it, we're going to do a um, you know, focused uh, cardiac exam. And then as far as procedures go, um, endotracheal tube placement uh, and central line placement, or maybe just vascular access in general are um, 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 very sort of useful and, and bread and butter applications. Next slide. So I think before we talk about lung ultrasound, we got to accept uh, one very important truth that the diagnostic accuracy of lung ultrasound is better than chest X-ray and similar to CT scans for common lung pathologies when performed by a trained provider. Um, this has been shown for the past uh, 20, 25 years in different studies from around the world, specifically in COVID-19. It's, it's kind of comical when you walk in the room and uh, people are covered head to toe and there's a disposable stethoscope at the bedside. Um, even without uh, lots of PPE on, um, I can't really hear much from those disposable stethoscopes. Um, and um, nowadays with all the PPE, it's even harder. So how can we examine the lungs um, in this situation? So this is where lung ultrasound comes in. So what are the key findings of lung ultrasound in COVID-19? So what do we know so far? First, the pleural line gets very irregular. Um, second, there are B lines, there are different patterns of B lines. Uh, typically, there's multiple B lines in, in both lung fields. They can be focal, multifocal, or even confluent. I'll show you some examples of that. Third is, uh, there's lots of these multifocal subpleural um, consolidations. I've been surprised at how many of these we see, um, especially on the anterior and middle lobes. And then uh, fourth important point is there's absence of pleural effusion. So compared to other infectious uh, diseases we see uh, like pneumonias, we don't see uh, very many pleural effusions in this disease. Next slide. So here's some examples of, um, of B lines. If you could go back one slide, Benji. Okay, so when we look at this image here, so we're basically in an intercostal um, space. And so there's a rib causing a rib shadow. 
if you could point that out, um, there's a rib and a rib shadow, and then another rib and a rib shadow, so right in between two ribs, and then about five millimeters deep to those ribs, we find the pleural line. And you'll, you can appreciate the pleural line here. It's not very smooth. It's very irregular. It looks, looks um, thickened, um, although it's really just better description is ir uh, that it's irregular. And then you see these ray-like beams going straight down to the bottom of the screen. And in this example, um, the bee lines are fusing and becoming more confluent. So you could see individual ones, once there's enough water content, they start to fuse. These are images from Gigi Liu uh, at Baltimore at Johns Hopkins uh, from a, a patient she had with COVID-19. Next slide. And this is an example of some um, subplural consolidations. Um, so if you look at the pleural line, there's a dark hypoechoic area just below the pleural line. And typically there is this sort of waterfall um, um, white beam uh, coming down to the far field from those. So we're seeing lots and lots of these in our COVID-19 patients. These are just a couple of exa examples. Um, for those of you who are on our other webinar, the image on the right there is from Gonzalo uh, Garcia de Casasola in, in Madrid. Those are his own images. Uh, he unfortunately got sick while working in the ER, um, um, but has recovered fortunately. Next slide. So there's lots of different lung ultrasound protocols. I think one of the key points here is you wanna look at the anterior wall, the lateral wall and the posterior wall. Could you click through those, Benji? They should pop up for us here. So important points are anterior, lateral, and then posterior. Okay, so there's lots of different protocols out there. Some people use scan lines, some people use multi-point exams. Um, I think you know, a, a very sort of practical point here is you need to label your images because when your colleagues come in after you, whether that's two hours after you or 20 days or, or two years after you, they're not gonna know where exactly you were. So put something on there to label them. Next slide. So how could we use long ultrasound and COVID-19? First, diagnosing these patients. There was a big push for CT, and we'll let uh, Dr. Shang talk about how they use CT in China. In most of the world, uh, we can't get to CT. So fever, cough, um, shortness of breath, and um, beeline subpleural consolidations, you've essentially ruled in the disease in a high prevalence area, which is unfortunately lots of the world now. Second common application would be for triage. You see a patient, you're not sure, can I send this guy home or do I need to admit him? You look at the lungs, you look at their saturations, you look at all their other laboratories and maybe the ultrasound findings would tip you in one direction or the other. Also, if they're gonna be admitted to the hospital, maybe it will tip you towards higher level care, ICU versus being on the floor. Um, and then last thing is serial evaluation. So once the patients are in the hospital um, or in the ICU, um, we're following them serially doing a daily lung ultrasound. Again, with the um, PAPR suits and all the PPE, it's very difficult to use those disposable stethoscopes. So that's lung ultrasound in a nutshell. And I'll give you some more resources at the end where you can learn more about it. A couple other points I wanna bring up before we open up to our panel of speakers. Goal-directed echo. I think most of you are familiar with this. This is typically gonna be five standard views, um, but at a minimum, you'd wanna get your, your parasternal views and then probably a, a, a apical four-chamber or subcostal four-chamber view, some kind of four-chamber view. Um, could you go to the next slide? So this is uh, an image. This is also one of Gigi's patients who had COVID-19 who had a uh, uh, acute decrease in the LV systolic function. We don't fully understand this disease. The Seattle group reported up to 33% of their patients. Uh, most of them were elderly that developed this. Um, but this is something you'll have to watch out for um, in these patients. Next slide. Last two applications I'm gonna mention, uh, central line placement. So uh, I think most of you are familiar with steps one and two. First, tracking the needle going into the vein and then confirming that your guide wire is in the vein and only in the vein, not going into the artery. The third one there um, is the final confirmation. Nice image courtesy of, of uh, Jamie Galen, who will be hearing from later on in one of his COVID patients. Can you play that video there, the far right one? So this is the RAS or right atrial swirl. Basic idea here is if the catheter is in the SVC close to the right atrium and you rapidly flush fluid, you should see bubbles in the right atrium um, almost instantaneously, but for sure in less than two seconds. If it takes longer than two seconds, the tip of the catheter is somewhere else. Uh, either it's curled or it's going into one of the other um, uh, large veins. Next slide. And the last one I'm going to mention is endotracheal intubation. Um, so what you want to see is on the left, what you don't want to see is on the right. So um, this is, both these are taken from the head of the bed. 
uh, courtesy of our colleague J Jeremy Boyd over at uh, Vanderbilt. So if you look at the one image on the right, you see that there's a perfectly circular tube popping through over to the side of the midline. So that tube is going into the esophagus. And then if you look at the image on the left, um, you'll see that there's movement, but it's mostly in the, in the center of the um, uh, trachea and the tracheal rings. So people call it like this um, double barrel or double hump sign that you, you don't want to see. I think um, it's a two-person job though to see that. And the last thing is once the tube is in to confirm that you're aerating both lungs, if, if pre-ultrasound, uh, I'm sorry, pre-intubation, you had good sliding and bilaterally, you should have good sliding post uh, tube placement. And if you don't see sliding, you probably push the tube in too far and need to pull it back, maybe right main stemmed or left main stemmed. Next slide. So here's some resources. Um, you know, we did a, a hour and 20 minute webinar on this about uh, 10 days ago. Um, it's posted. It's a free download. You could watch it and it, we go into a little bit more detail. It's on YouTube and on the Chess website. Uh, the second um, bullet there, these are some uh, websites from some of the manufacturers. I don't work for any of them. I'm not promoting their products, but they put some free education out there. So you can uh, take advantage of that without even buying any of their machines. And then last one is Twitter. There's lots of good stuff out there on Twitter, lots of short clips, um, good education out there. So now I'd like to welcome uh, two of our uh, guest speakers. So Giovanni Volpicelli, and, and first we're gonna talk for, with Dr. Yao Shang from Wuhan, China. Um, I had the pleasure of visiting Dr. Shang in 2016. He was the uh, lead translator for our, the first edition of our point of care ultrasound book. Um, and there was the Chess World Congress in China, and I was able to jump over and actually visit him and visit their ICU. Hopefully one day it can get back together. It seems like, um, gosh, we've all been in isolation for, for way too long. He's in the critical care department there, but really works throughout the hospital. It's a very large hospital, um, 5,000 beds. Um, could you go to the next slide, Benji? I think this video, this is the uh, entrance area. This is the lobby where they have uh, 10,000 clinic visits per day. So I thought our clinics were pretty busy and he said 10,000 clinic visits per day. Wow. Um, and that, this is the, the entrance area there um, to the clinics. And then there's a picture there of the ICU uh, with Dr. Shang and, and some of his colleagues um, in, in Wuhan. So Yao, are you on the call? Yes, I'm Yu Shang. Thanks yes. for your for dinner. Thanks for your invitation. Oh no, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, you know, you, because the this pandemic started in Wuhan, your experience is uh, very valuable for all of us to see maybe what's down the road for us. Um, so I had a couple questions here. Um, just in general. Um, you know, what did Wuhan do to prevent the spread to other cities in China? So I, I think, you know, when this uh, virus hit Italy and Europe and even the United States, it's spreading very quickly to all these other cities and countries. Um, tell us about what happened there in Wuhan when, and how this thing um, uh, evolved. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, I, I try my best to answer these questions. Uh, since the outbreak of COVID-19 from January, then, then the, the many, many measures of strategy was, were carried out for contain the spread of COVID-19. For example, stay at home is an important basic requirement. Then the screen and the testing everyone who have symptoms all the patients with COVID-19 are admitted to hospital or mobile cabin hospital. Hmm. Uh, suspe suspected infected cases are isolated for at least uh, two weeks observation. Uh, so this measure is very helpful for control the spread of COVID-19. Yeah, that's great. Then, the, the lockdown, lockdown, mm. Wuhan, Wuhan is lockdown for already about seven and 70 and six days is the most important strategy for the contain the spread of COVID-19 to other cities in Wuhan. Mm. 
Uh, so, but uh, but now the situation is better. Life in Wuhan is uh, coming back on the track, on the normal track, uh, because the 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 the, the outbreak or the epidemic of COVID-19 is uh, is controlled. In that, it's controlled. With, <coughs> so, so there is there is the second question. <laughs> I'm also. And third, there is no second surge of COVID-19 in Wuhan now. So yeah, that's great. So you haven't seen a second surge after everything opened up. So now is everything open, meaning the stores and the schools and offices and people are getting together again? No, no, no. Uh, it's getting back uh, slowly, slow, slow, step by step. Uh, the school is not open, but uh, the bus, the metro, is uh, is run as normal. Yeah, and are, would you would you say most people are wearing a masks in public? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The mask. Uh, I think of the mask is very important uh, for everyone, we include yeah. uh, for such as a doctor, nurse, healthcare worker, and uh, every everyone. If you are or you are on work or on bus or, or metro, you must wear your mask. So mask is very important. I think it's no problem. So yeah. I want to say some words that uh, I I heard so I heard some friends in America as a doctor they they don't have enough mask for 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 prevention the COVID-19. Uh, so I, 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 I'm very, I'm worrying about this situation. So everyone must wear a mask. It's very important. Yeah, I think even without the outbreak, many people in China just wear a mask just when they travel. And so this isn't a big sort of cultural change for a lot of people there. Um, yeah, there's a lot of concern here. Right now, we are, in quotes, flattening the curve. And in many parts of the country, there hasn't been a big surge. But there's obviously this concern that once we open everything up again, there's going to be the surge when we start to relax. So um, hopefully not. Thank you. Um, real quick about ultrasound. How any pearls for this group about how you and your colleagues use ultrasound in the care of the patients there in your hospital? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you mentioned in your your slide, uh, I think your slide uh, talk about uh, all, talk about uh, talked about uh, everything we do. First, uh, we can use uh, ultrasound as a screen tool for the uh, clinical fever patients. You know the city scan with a long time and uh, with a long a lot of money. So we, if you, if the patient have a syndrome, then we have we can have a quick ultrasound examination. Then uh, it was used as a screen. Then you know, as you know, I'm an ICU doctor. So in the ICU, I will I use the ultrasound as a monitor for the for the for as a monitor for get the information about the patient the states of the past physiology cause get the past physiological information of the patients in ICU. Uh, second, second, we can use the, the ultrasound as a guide as a guide for the procedure such as the insert the CVC CVC and the other catheter. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, oh, um, okay. I, was gonna, I think one of the most important things you said is um, when 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 this hit Wuhan, uh, there was lockdown immediately, and people that presented that were either suspected or positive, they didn't go home. They just went to a separate hospital, a cabin hospital, where they were isolated. I think that's something that we've been slow or slower to implement aggressively. It's this balance of people's personal freedoms and public health. Um, well, that's great. I'm I'm gonna. Um, carry on to um, our next um, guest speaker, um, Giovanni Volpicelli. So I think most of you know Dr. Volpicelli from all his lung ultrasound work. Um, if you were expecting the famous football player, a uh, soccer player, um, I think the soccer player was named after this Giovanni. So we're bringing you the real Giovanni. Um, so Giovanni's in Northern Italy in uh, Torino, not too far from Milan, uh, about an hour and a half uh, west of Milan 
works in the emergency department, but he's in some ways um, more of a um, hospitalist too, because he manages an emergency department ward, which is an inpatient ward where the COVID patients that are not intubated are managed. So next slide. So Giovanni, you know, when we talked, you mentioned waves and surges of patients. Um, tell us about your experience the last six weeks in Italy, and then let's talk a little bit about ultrasound and how you've been using it, and if you have any pearls for this group. Um, well, I must say that um, we lived uh, uh, three different waves. Uh, when we started seeing patients with COVID-19, they were mainly uh, elderly patients with uh, co-pathologies. And uh, uh, our main problem was to understand uh, which pathology was bringing the patient to us. Uh, then we leave the second wave, that was the, the worst wave, uh, when many young persons, young patients started coming. And uh, in this phase, it was quite, quite easy to understand who was uh, affected by COVID-19 and who was not, because I may say that 90% of patients were all COVID-19. And in that moment, my hospital changed totally because uh, we, uh, other pathologies almost disappeared. I don't know how, but it, uh, it happened. And now we are leaving a third phase, a third wave, uh, and we are assisting a, a phenomenon that is uh, quite uh, uh, strange and, uh, and uh, never, uh, never seen before, that is most of the patients we have now are patients coming from the resting houses. I don't know if in English is the correct name. Uh, the places where the elderly patients stay uh, for uh, the rest of the, their life. Uh, and we have a, a lot of patients um, coming from these houses. Um, that is very complex situation because these patients are complex patients, of course. Uh, in some way, the wave now is reducing. And um, even if the number of uh, new infected is still high, uh, what we are observing is that the, um, the number of patients coming to the emergency departments, is, it, it is going down uh, day by day. That is a good sign, in my opinion, because it's the, the best and most real sign of what is going on with the disease and how the disease is, uh, is spreading still or not. Um, we, we see less uh, number of young persons now infected. That is a good sign, of course. And regarding the second question, uh, that is the point. When we started using uh, ultrasound in our patients, uh, we were just a little bit um, confused because you know the signs of uh, uh, the disease uh, at lung ultrasound uh, are similar to other diseases in rds we see the same signs we see belines we see uh, consolidations uh, we see irregular pleural line um, so we were a little bit confused uh, but then uh, talking with the uh, other experts in lung ultrasound, uh, we time by time realized that there, there was something magic in the ultrasound examination. And we were all agree that um, just putting the probe in the patient with a pneumonia from COVID-19, we were able to say, it is, it is pneumonia from COVID-19. And the point was just to understand how to standardize this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, opinion, this uh, impression. Uh, and slowly and time by time, uh, we 
I think that we found the, the key point uh, and the key point are mainly, in my opinion, mainly uh, two. The first key point is that the kind of, you know, pneumonia in COVID-19 is mainly an interstitial disease. So the B lines are the main actors of uh, this uh, pattern. And uh, uh, we observing carefully these B lines, we uh, found that there is one kind of a vertical artifact that is really highly specific because uh, it is not that it, it is not true that it is only in COVID-19, but almost all the patients with COVID-19 they have. And this artifact is an artifact large, a band, uh, echoic, very shining, uh, with a large uh, part of the pleura where, where this artifact arises. And the pleura in that point is regular, is totally regular. In our opinion, this sign is the sign of some very acute early uh, interstitial involvement that is corresponding to the ground glass uh, alteration or pacification that we see at, at uh, CAT scan. The second key point is the kind of um, Mm, patchy distribution uh, of clusters of this kind of B lines together with uh, um, usual B lines, so separated B lines, together with uh, uh, coalescent B lines, together with uh, peripheral consolidation, together with irregular pleural line. So all these together in clusters distributed in both lungs uh, in multifocal uh, distribution and patchy distribution, so without any rule, this uh, kind of pattern is typical of the disease. So uh, putting together uh, the, the type of B lines we see and the distribution, this uh, crazy and patchy distribution of clusters of all these signs altogether, uh, I think that this kind of pattern is uh, what we named a uh, high probability pattern for COVID-19. All the other patterns are less probable, uh, less probability, less uh, um, degree of probability that we call it intermediate probability, or alternative pattern that uh, give a sign of some other disease that is going on in the lung, not the COVID-19. So putting together these two key points, uh, we improved a lot in uh, managing lung ultrasound in these patients. How to use it? Uh, very briefly. Uh, using it is uh, based on uh, correlating the pattern with the kind of patients you have. So the symptom of the patients, but also how long the patient uh, is having the symptoms. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, in our opinion, it changes a lot uh, the way uh, you will manage the patient after that. The other point is that the lung ultrasound is much more, I think we all agree about that. We have no data now, but we will have very soon is much more sensitive than chest X-ray. So when we don't see any sign in lung ultrasound, we don't perform chest X-ray in our patients. And these patients are those patients may be infected, but without pneumonia that we can discharge at home and we can follow up from home in isolation, of course. Uh, whereas in patients with uh, severe respiratory failure, that is another phenotype, um, a, negative chest, a negative lung ultrasound, in my opinion, uh, can rule out the disease, not only the pneumonia, also the infection. Um, but this is all under discussion and this is what we will try to demonstrate in the future.
That's great, Giovanni. So, and you also have a publication coming out soon describing all these findings, right? Can you just tell us, is that the Journal of um, Intensive Care Medicine? Intensive Care Medicine accepted our uh, protocol and it is going to be published, I think, uh, in these uh, following days. Usually, Intensive Care Medicine is very uh, quick in uh, putting the publication from acceptance to uh to public publication and uh i think it will be in these days yeah in, in, th in this paper in this paper we describe uh, exactly the technique that is very similar to what you already illustrated and we also describe all these signs uh, the sign that i'm telling you we called light beam because it's a light uh, uh, large light. Uh, of course, it is dependent on the kind of probe you use. Uh, uh, in my opinion, what I suggest is to use the convex probe. That is the best probe to see enough detail of the plural line and enough depth uh, with low uh, frequency to see to study uh, the vertical artifacts. This is very important in my opinion. That's great. Thanks so much for joining us, Giovanni. Um, it's 3 a.m. I think where you are right now and you're in the ER. So it's an uh, uh, extra special treat for us to have you on this call. No, we, we are lucky because today is a very calm day and we have here only one patient with COVID-19 uh, doing CPAP. Uh, all the other patients are patients from yesterday. So it's great. <laughs> That's great. Congratulations. We hope that we can get there soon too. Uh, Benji, I'm going to pass it over to you now. Um, Happy to take over here. So thank you, Dr. Sony. Thank you, Dr. Shang. And thank you, Dr. Volpicelli. So a lot of good, good pearls there about the kind of pneumonia, types of vertical artifacts, patchy distributions, and just the um, the fact that lung ultra are much more sensitive than chest x-ray. You know, um, we'll look forward to the publication, but in meanwhile here for the remaining part of the hour, let's hear from our East Coast colleagues with our New York City and Baltimore crew. We'll start with Dr. Linda Kurian, who's uh, again, Chief of uh, Hospital Medicine there at Northwell, and she's really on the battlefront there. There's a picture of her in the tent. So maybe Dr. Kurian, you can tell us, are you still in the tent? And secondly, um, maybe a little bit more, uh, maybe specifics about building off that discussion we just had. How are you? Uh, and your group using ultrasound in your practice? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not in the tent. Thankfully, I'm at home. Um, so mm -hmm. um, yeah, thanks, Benji, Neelam, and uh, Gordy for having me. Um, I'm certainly happy to share our experience here. So um, just to give a little bit of perspective, I'm here at um, uh, the two tertiary campuses of Northwell Health, and these hospitals are located in, in Queens and Western NASA, and, and both hospitals have been hit particularly hard uh, with the COVID crisis. Uh, these areas have have been. So of course, you know, our, our cases have been in exponentially increasing over the last several days. Um, our hospitalist groups have now expanded to also include our colleagues from several medicine subspecialties and our surgical specialties and even some of our PEDS colleagues and, and um, PEDS subspecialists as well. Uh, and my own team has really stepped into some spaces that they haven't been familiar with for years um, uh, and really taking uh, taking um, lead roles there as well. So very happy to see the, the sort of bond and unity amongst all of our teams. Um, really everyone stepping out of their traditional roles and, and everyone's now unified in one specialty and we're calling ourselves all COVIDists. Um, so like much like Neelam and our colleagues in China and Italy described, our POCUS trained hospitalists have found bedside ultrasound, ultrasound to be invaluable in evaluating and caring for our patients. We're using POCUS to evaluate COVID patients and to monitor the progression of disease, like um, uh, our colleagues mentioned. And so same things, what are we using it for? We're mostly doing lung ultrasound, of course, um, generally showing B lines in varying degrees of confluence. Uh, we have, we're seeing, you know, anywhere from scattered B lines um, and as the disease evolves over time with patients becoming more and more symptomatic and uh, increasing degrees of hypoxia, we're seeing that um, this evolves to more confluent states as well. Um, so we're seeing, you know, a fair amount of subpleural consolidations and, and certainly thickening of that pleural stripe. Um, so 
you know, with cardiac ultrasound, we found it to be, uh, as usual, pretty helpful in assessment of patients in shock. Uh, and certainly now there's um, there's uh, quite a bit of evidence that there's there's uh, uh, myocarditis that gets um, uh, associated with some for some of these patients. And you know, we're using cardiac ultrasound to help assess and monitor these patients' ventricular function as well. Uh, and of course, you know, I think there's a lot of evidence that's come out recently, or at least some suggestions that uh, these patients are in a prothrombotic or a hypercoagulable state. So we've been using vascular ultrasound combined with cardiac ultrasound for any of our patients who have worsening hypoxia, respiratory symptoms, and we're seeing rising D-dimers for these patients. So, you know, we've we've already seen quite a few patients that have VTEs, and POCUS has been very helpful in evaluating uh, these cases. Um, so, you know, our teams, we've been using mostly CART-based solutions, uh, CART-based ultrasounds. We've just found it really much easier to clean compared to our handhelds. Um, but that said, it's it's interesting because a lot of our colleagues and certainly several societies um, have put out guidelines and great videos on, on using handheld ultrasound for POCUS. Um, so uh, if I'm putting a plug out there for Ernest Fisher's really fun video on Twitter that he posted last night on donning a portable ultrasound um, a device with a sterile probe cover, really interesting uh, and a lot of fun to watch that video. Um, uh, and you know, one thing that we've been asking our providers to keep in mind, our physicians to keep in mind, you know, uh, performing POCUS exams at the bedside keeps a uh, keeps a provider in close proximity to their patients. Um, and so we really ask that they're being very mindful about doing exams that really only are necessary or indicated um, or those that may change management. Um, you know, we really want to be able to to um, optimize that that time spent at the bedside and, and certainly be mindful of, of how much time they are spending there. Um, and of course, you know, where we found it helpful, and certainly this tent is an example of where we will probably be using it, um, is um, areas that, uh, you know, as the hospital scale up their capacity and they're um, starting to occupy some pretty creative spaces, that's not even the most creative of the spaces that's um, out there. Um, we find that it is so helpful to have POCUS um, in these areas because not not easy to transport them to different areas to really get imaging. So, um, you know, all in, I'm being very cautiously optimistic about what I'm seeing here. Um, numbers wise, we're starting to see that our admissions are starting to slow down and stabilize. Um, you know, our patients are, are staying longer. We have, um, though, had several hundred discharges from our hospital. So that's great. And, and just today, I saw a uh, uh, text from one of our colleagues that we successfully extubated four patients, and um, that's just amazing. So we're hoping to get to where Giovanni is um, sooner than later. No, thank you, Dr. Curry, and I think, uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, your expertise. Again, stay safe. Thanks for serving there. Thanks for really providing some hope, even in the dark times that we uh, you, you had in the last uh, several weeks there. So, uh, so good to see you on the front lines, uh, and especially on 60 Minutes. So um, we'll keep moving along for sake of time here. Thank you, Dr. Korean. We're going to go over to uh, Dr. Galen, uh, goes by first name Jamie. Uh, so Jamie, if you want to talk next uh, from your experience again, again, building off of what the last speakers have talked about, how has your ultrasonic experience been uh, from your perspective? Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I want to add to what Dr. Kurian uh, said about the advantages of point care ultrasound in this uh, epidemic and caring for these patients. Uh, I think that uh, it's, so I don't have to sell this audience on uh, the value of uh, point of care ultrasound, but but to be very specific, uh, I like that we can go in once, and uh, going in once reduces uh, our PPE utilization. Uh, it also decreases patient transport. So we um, assessed a patient. I don't know if this video will play uh, as an example of someone uh, newly admitted with uh, worsening respiratory failure, and uh, the the quick. Um, you know, cardiac ultrasound revealed severe LV dysfunction concerning for uh, critical illness, uh, cardiomyopathy, stress myopathy, or uh, this this new uh, COVID myocarditis. And it was an immediate uh, game changer uh, in this case because the uh, prior um, thoughts about either septic shock or um, clearly, you know, other types of shock were, were less likely. There's another uh, clip that has the the IVC as well, but this was uh, a severely reduced um, LV function with uh, dilated IVC uh, and no significant valvular disease. So we very quickly 
uh, changed our thinking um, about the case uh, from a patient who was developing septic physiology to one that was really cardiogenic shock. So our management was uh, central line placement with dobutamine. And um, I think that as an example, uh, these images are, are valuable to our colleagues, you know, working closely with uh, experts in cardiology and heart failure uh, to manage a case of suspected um, COVID myocarditis uh, as an example. Uh, to, to show you some images, but I think that uh, transporting patients with COVID throughout the hospital is uh, something that can be minimized using focus and also uh, the, the going in once where you're going to do the procedure, you're going to get the images that you need, the, the cardiac and chest imaging uh, is, is a, a, save, a saver of the PPE. Um, and, and I think just uh, to, to add one more point about uh, focus in this crisis is it's really about the basics. Um, I think that I, I really like seeing um, a, a patient who's acutely hypoxic or worsening O2 requirement. I like seeing that they don't have a pneumothorax. Some of these patients have bolus lung disease. They're on positive pressure. Um, you know, it may not be uh, the most common complication uh, in, in the COVID uh, scenario, but it, it's the basics of clinical ultrasound that that we can really emphasize. And and I think as Dr. Stoney pointed out, pleural effusion is not a common pathology. But I like knowing that uh, there isn't a pleural effusion or a pericardial effusion, um, and then getting that answer immediately. Um, I think there are a lot of unknowns uh, about this illness and its, and its uh, disease course in a, in a variety of different patient populations. And having ultrasound um, as, as an augmented uh, physical exam tool um, and as a diagnostic tool at the bedside is, is critical um, in this time. So thank you for letting me share that case. And um, I also wanted to add that uh, we're uh, fighting here in New York and we have a lot of uh, support from uh, our colleagues and it's just a, a moment of um, where where uh, we're able to really collaborate across disciplines, and I think point of care ultrasound is 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 a great field of, uh, that allows for multidisciplinary collaboration, uh, and, and it's a time for us to really reach out to our our colleagues in uh, other disciplines to, to help us um, use ultrasound to serve these patients. So thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Gale. And we may, if we have some time, we can talk a little bit more about that partnership that you developed with cardiology and just taking the lead with bedside ultrasound, especially in. Uh, focused heart ultrasound. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for leading on the front lines there. With uh, our next uh, guest speaker will be Dr. Mintz from uh, Cornell. Maybe he's joined by Dr. Wong. I don't know. But uh, Dr. Mintz, uh, maybe you can give us your perspective on uh, from the past speakers on how you're using ultrasound in your practice in Cornell. Hi there. The, yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go yeah, ahead. Great. Hi. So uh, it's really been a very dynamic uh, situation where uh, a lot of us are being trained to do ICU work, which we normally don't do. So for a lot of us, it's been transitioned from relatively stable early presentations, earlier presentations in the hospital to really advanced ICU cases. and. Uh, uh, Pocus uh, is really very different, I think, in different contexts. I we have I personally have not uh, found any changes on Pocus which would correlate with clinical status beyond pulse oximetry. Uh, what pulse oximetry would offer, so people basically who get ill, they just get ill. Uh, we could not quantify the number of zones of beeline or beeline density uh, or distribution as predicting anything uh, which we could not predict based on uh, more readily available factors. We have tried to, and uh, working on this, we're trying to implement some point of care ultrasonography with some remote support from our group uh, with our outpatient colleagues who started cough clinic and uh, uh, trying to do what Dr. Walpicelli mentioned. If you do, so we basically right now in this situation where everyone has COVID and uh, the question is one, do you have a pneumonia? And two, do you have something else on top of your COVID? And uh, how do you manage this? So in clinic, we hope that a useful approach would be in the context where you can't get an x-ray, a person with an upper respiratory illness 
who comes in and has no radiographic findings, meaning no, no scenographic findings of pneumonia, can safely be discharged if otherwise they can be sent home. They, can, uh, uh, they don't need to go to the emergency room, which on a population scale uh, should make a big difference in the number of ICU visits. Uh, and then there is a whole slur of, of cases where patients, we saw several cases of people with COVID and things like acute tuberculosis, uh, empyema, there have been several cases, uh, all in COVID positive patients, still waiting for a first case of tamponade with COVID, uh, haven't seen that yet, but it will happen. CHF and COVID. So uh, you really need to know what you're doing when you uh, when you're doing this. And of course, the whole different uh, ball game is ICU patients. Where uh, I mean, for some historical reasons, our ICU folks are not very ultrasound trained, and a lot of things they do they historically have relied on a lot of imaging and now they're basically forced to fly blind and uh, it, it really is affecting them I think uh, and what also I think is was emphasized already by everybody but I'm going to say it again uh, the stream of patients has been such at times that you frequently go in you're all gowned up and you do know very little about the patient you're meeting. You, you know the age, you know some basic comorbidities. You frequently did not have a chance to review the chart uh, to the extent that we used to do. And uh, uh, you cannot talk to them, basically, because you're trying to not be in the room for a very long time. You cannot examine them. Uh, that being said, I do listen to their lungs because wheezing you cannot really pick up on ultrasound, and there have been a few cases of uh, asthma exacerbation, basically viral asthma, and we do need to know that uh, there is a wheeze. But yeah, outside of this, th this really has replaced uh, in in what we do, and at least what I do has replaced physical exam and history taking for the most part. You do be almost your entire evaluation with ultrasound in hand. And uh, uh, we've picked up uh, cases of chronic CHF. They may or may not be fluid overloaded at the time, but later we would confirm that this is new or old. But at the time you examine them, you know nothing about them. This really at times has been, and, and where I am, we're relatively protected. Where Linda is and Jamie are, is they, they really, as there's an onslaught and we're expecting uh, a second wave of patients coming from there to, to where we practice. Uh, but yeah, it's been a mess. Uh, we do a lot of ultrasounds of everything you guys said, uh, plus DVTs, which Linda talked about. And uh, I, yeah, I don't know what else to... That's that's a good start here. I think uh, you've been uh, pretty uh, busy there. I have again text back and forth from you. Yeah, that's a lot of uh, a lot of patients you're seeing, a lot of scanning. So I appreciate the kind of the balancing measure of when do you need to go into the room versus when uh, when is it actually helpful. Um, so it's good to hear that uh, back and forth a little bit. Maybe for sake of time, I'm going to go to Dr. Lou next, and then if we have time, we can kind of have a summary statement from uh, Dr. Sony potentially. Um, Dr. Lou is next year from Hopkins, so we want to welcome her and uh, just uh, Dr. Lou is probably going to share a little bit about uh, some cases that she saw as well, some rapid fire cases. So Dr. Lou? Hi, thank you very much for having me. Um, next slide. I think I'm just going to present three really quick ones to kind of show how chronic ultrasound could potentially help or assist in your clinical management and certainly um, you know, we are still learning how ultrasound can help in the case uh, with uh, from the lung uh, aspect. So this one is a 56-year-old woman with diabetes and hypertension. She come on admission on day one of her symptoms, and on admission, her O2 status is about 98 to 100% on room air. Respiratory is about 18. She was febrile at T max of 39.3. And so this is the first, the the one on the right is basically the very first. Um, the first scan on the right zone one, we basically see mostly A lines. 
And then 12 hours later, you see of this like ray of big C, uh, B, thick B lines that the Dr. Wobocelli has been mentioning about. I'm not gonna show the rest of the other lung scanning, but basically in 12 hours, the, instead of only two zones with B lines on, uh, on the mission, 12 hours later, all 12 zones has all B lines, um, along with the pleural consolidation on the posterior back. At that time, her O2 set is still is still 98% to 100% on room air. Her respiratory rate gone up a little bit from like 18 to maybe 25. I was a little worried, but the O2 set did not tell me the story. The ultrasound actually told me more of the story. And I was kind of wondering, like, is she going to be intubated soon? But this she presented to me like the very first week of when Johns Hopkins Hospital actually had COVID patients. And so I wasn't as experienced enough to say, hey, maybe I need to start calling the intensive care unit ICU, maybe consider intubation. And after I signed up this patient within three hours, she was intubated up in the ICU. So she so was intubated on March 23rd, and she's still intubated now in our ICU unit. And so in this case, what gave me the, the idea is that the uh, vital signs gave me nothing about how sick these people are. In this particular case, the ultrasound actually gave me more insight as to what's going on with her lungs. The fact that it's gone from two zones with thick B lines to all 12 zones with thick B lines in 12 hours gave me a lot of clue as to what might happen to her. I wish that next time if this happened to me, I would have electively intubated instead of scrambling with our uh, 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 with, uh, with, uh, with the code to try to get her up to the intensive care unit. Go on with the next one. So the next one is kind of a question and in terms of whether lung ultrasound could potentially help us with the ventilation strategy. So this is a patient uh, of whom initially my colleague thought would be look really sick. 55 year old gentleman on day 10 of the flu-like symptoms of COVID-19 come in with the three liters of oxygen um, setting at about 95%, respiratory rate about 25. And my colleague at that time was saying, oh my God, he's on oxygen. I'm really worried about how he looks. But when I put the ultrasound on, zone R1, 2, 3, 4 on both sides of the lung were completely all A lines. And now it's like, why is this guy on three liters of oxygen? And so then I look at the back and these are some impressive subplural consolidations on both the right and left posterior zone. And so given that, I thought, hmm, maybe I should prone this guy. Next slide, please. Next. So I decided to prone. Three liters, why not? He's on three liters, he's on one of the regular floor. Prone him, within 12 hours, he'd gone from three liters to room air. So, and then he was completely stable, never been upgraded to the ICU, and he was discharged in three days. Next slide. So the last case I want to show is that I do think some uh, POCUS at least give me a little bit of reassurance in terms of when we may want to discharge a patient. So this is a patient who also come in on day six of COVID-19, come in with three, uh, two liters of oxygen. Um, and so on the mission, you can see, this is just on left zone one, um, you can see this big uh, B lines. And when I first scan her, her R4, L1, and both of her posterior right and left uh, zones have both a uh, subplural consolidation and really thick B lines as well. And then when uh, the day before she's discharged, I decided I want to take a look and see how she looks like, even though clinically she also looks pretty good too. And impressively enough, um, her um, all her anterior and lateral zones, except maybe in the diaphragm area, which I'll show next, um, turn from like some big th uh, uh, thick B lines to essentially A lines, which is what you see on the screen. Next slide. Next slide. So the, the, the other impressive thing is that this is on around right zone four. You see this like, you know, irregular uh, plural line with thick B lines coming down. And she is the one of the field that has a very small plural effusion right there. And upon discharge, those thick B lines and irregularity of the pleural line is completely gone. You see these are A lines coming here. And that this uh, and the pleural effusion is a lot less. And so ultrasound to me, these three cases kind of illustrate 
potentially give me some indication as to when the patient get really sick and may be needing upgrade. Potentially may allow me to decide maybe proning or maybe some other strategy may help depending on the distribution of these findings that we see. And at least give me some type of reassurance as to, you know, maybe that person is ready to go home. So thank you very much for letting me share these three cases. And uh, thus, at least this is how I am trying to serially use lung ultrasound to help care for my patients. Well, thank you, Dr. Liu. I appreciate it. Thank you for all of our panelists here walking through these uh, cases. Humbling to hear stories from the front lines, and especially from Wuhan all the way to Torino, Italy, to now New York City and Baltimore. So thank you for doing this. We have a few questions that have come through. So I'm going to uh, maybe take a few minutes over the past of the hour and we'll start a rapid fire, kind of walk through them. Um, you know, uh, some take home points we talked about a little bit, but uh, some had asked a little bit about high risk DVT with COVID. Um, maybe, uh, maybe I can point this to Dr. Mintz. Can I welcome him back just for a one minute highlight again? Are you, uh, just the takeaway, are you doing lower extremity scans? How are you using D-dimers? Is there some sort of full anticoagulation going on? Do you feel comfortable with that kind of framework of a question? I mean, I feel comfortable with any frame of a question, but the uh, so the, we're seeing several very interesting patterns. So the uh, the so one, there are just more DVTs and PEs than uh, we would expect otherwise. We are not only so people are clotting dialysis catheters, CVVH, people are clotting everything. Uh, the uh, there are more DVTs, so the not only are we scanning legs, I have scanned uh, the IJs after people get out of ICU. Pretty much every IJ which had a catheter in it has a clot. Uh, I mean, again, my anecdotal, it's not a large sample, uh, my personal skip, but the the a lot of clots. So the hospital right now is working on a uh, uh, project where we're trying to correlate number of DVTs like this with uh, uh, either absolute level of D-dimer or the rise of D-dimer. D-dimer is being checked now daily. It is not unusual to see people with D-dimer levels of uh, 10,000 in our hospital, which is you know, it's astronomical numbers. The, uh, the our cutoffs is like what 325 or something like this. The, the, this in our units. So, but we also seeing uh, micro what, that was described from uh, in uh, the literature from China. We are seeing people who have PEs and don't have identifiable DVTs and people who have microvascular uh, manifestations. So the uh, there is either, there are a lot of skin lesions which uh, look like either vasculitis or vasculopathy. And these, of course, you will not be able to detect by any ultrasound that you do. Uh, some ventilated patients have gigantic amount of dead space uh, in disproportion to what you would expect for the degree of ARDS. And there's ongoing, uh, th there is discussion about full anticoagulating these people and even giving them TPA. Uh, we haven't really quite gotten there yet, but I think it may be getting there. So yeah, I am looking very hard to therapeutically, for reasons to therapeutically anticoagulate people. Uh, and uh, I think there's going to be more to come, but right now there is no clarity on this. I wonder yeah. what the experiences are from other places. Yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Min. So that's a rapid fire kind of response. Appreciate you taking that. The next question I get from the chat box is uh, kind of putting together a slide quickly on this as well. Let's see if it will play here. Um, it's partnerships forged during the pandemic. So uh, maybe I can have the Dr. Galen, if he's available for this one. He wrote a paper recently with a couple of these crew as well. So uh, there's uh, cardiology, radiology. How, how are you navigating the partnerships there? Dr. Galen, if you're comfortable with this question, uh, happy to feel that. Thank you so much. Well, I think uh, every institution has um, its own, um, you know, situation with with uh, availability of, of uh, laboratories that typically acquire uh, images and interpret them. So uh, the uh, solution, you know, is very institution specific. But I think that at, at the problem uh, that you want to solve um, is is one that 
um, you know, takes into account the um, what's what tests are necessary. So um, not all of these patients need an echocardiogram. Uh, the threshold to get a formal echo might be um, higher in this uh, epidemic than um, you know uh, previously, where you wouldn't give it any thought because a, a tech has to go into the room, uh, potentially exposing him or herself. And, and the uh, American Society of Echocardiography has. Uh, a position on the appropriate use of, of echocardiogram in this uh, pandemic, but specifically about uh, how to how to work across the aisle with uh, point of care ultrasound. You know, ways to do that include um, if you have an image storage um, and retrieval uh, system in place. Um, previously, the uh, answer from some divisions like cardiology or or radiology, you know, might be that that they weren't um, going to help interpret your images. Uh, that you acquired, but uh, I think finding ways to uh, be strategic where your images might be sufficient to, to guide uh, subsequent uh, imaging or limited echo, for instance, um, or, or obviate the need for uh, more images uh, if you have that, that level of support. But it does take uh, some effort and, and it does take some infrastructure and technology to make that happen if you can't um, share the images easily you know, with echocardiographers to, to look at them uh, then it's going to be hard to, uh, you know, reduce the echo lab exposure uh, to, to patients with COVID-19. Um, so, but I think it's a great opportunity to have that discussion, uh, share your mutual problems, um, and come up with with shared solutions um, that that may even last beyond the the COVID-19, um, you know, uh, epidemic. So I hope that's a, just a quick answer. Um, uh, if anyone has any questions, they can certainly reach out. Thank you, Dr. Galen. And the last couple of questions I'll kind of field to maybe Dr. Sony here. And the next one's on uh, really decontamination um, of devices, uh, telemedicine even. And maybe, uh, Dr. Sony, I'm going to ask you to, if you could summarize kind of our main takeaways from this hour, and I'll do some closing as well. So, Dr. Sony? Sure. Um, thanks, everybody, for all your, your pearls. I just want to add on to what Jamie said. The American Society of Echo said the initial cardiac exam should be a focus exam. Uh, you don't need to get a full platform echo. They will be indicated in certain cases, but if you can answer it with a focus exam and share your exam with the cardiologist, you, in many cases, will get the answers you need. Same thing for radiology. If you go to the um, uh, RSNA website, they've changed the recommendations on CTs of the chest several times. Last update was at the end of March. Bottom line is you can get CTs. You got to have a really good reason to get a CT because you're going to expose techs, patients, so not, um, um, other people, even just in the hallways when these patients are transported. And there's lots of work for decontaminating the machines. So speaking about decontamination, especially for ultrasound probes, pretty much all of these Sani wipes, um, brand name Sani wipes in the U.S. will work. Um, the HB ones that end in HB, um, those can't be used. Um, but the wet time is two to three minutes. If you want to remember a number, three minutes is a safe bet. Um, bleach wipes are one minute. And um, so it's no different than really decontaminating for any of these other sort of common um, pathogens. I like this picture you're showing right now where you can also put some of these handheld devices into a, a plastic sheath and that reduces your um, you know, need to, um, to clean. You still had to wipe it down after you take it out of the sheath, but um, the handhelds do have the big advantage of being quick and easy to um, sterilize and clean. Um, so from just a practicality standpoint, I think having, I would, I, I love the images of a cart-based system, but having several handhelds that lots of providers can use and quickly get in and out and clean very quickly has a definite advantage in this um, situation. Um, as far as telemedicine goes, there's tele-ultrasound um, available through some of the different ultrasound manufacturers, also through, um, there's the IIT Reacts product, um, I think um, Butterfly Ultrasound has some of these. This is not an all-inclusive list of the different products, but, um, and in China, I know they've been doing tele-ultrasound across ICUs across the entire country for several years now, where you can see everything, the tele, the ultrasound, the patient with several cameras. Um, but as far as working with your consultants go, um, you can use these softwares to share your images in real time while somebody's in the room and somebody's outside the room. It could be a hospitalist, it could be a cardiologist or a radiologist or somebody else looking at the images. Um, so it could be even with your own colleagues or a consultant that you want to talk to. Um, and then this is also um, you know, another way to even get people who are 
um, off campus who could be at home, this becomes a training issue, I think, for us in that we have people who are very comfortable and some people who are not so comfortable. So we're going to uh, make ourselves available using some of this tele-ultrasound software to even coach somebody through capturing the views that, that would help them um, right there in real time. So uh, I, I've got to say thank you to all of our panelists. Um, um, Yao, uh, Giovanni, Greg, uh, Gigi, Linda, Jamie, um, and all of you who joined us from home. Um, I, I think one of the most important things that, that I took away from what uh, Giovanni told me and what Yao told me is that um, things will get better. Um, we may have a new baseline. We're going to have to be more cautious for some time, but we'll get through this um, and things will get better. Um, it's great to hear you're in the emergency room right now in Torino, Italy, and you've had one patient with COVID compared to, you know, tens or hundreds of them in the past several weeks. Um, so it's a process and we will make it uh, through together. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. Thanks uh, to Teresa and SHM for organizing this. Um, and good luck, everyone. Take care of yourselves. Most important, wear your yep. mask. Thank you, Neelam. Uh, final comments here as well. This is a uh, thank you for the hope and the information that we can share for the hour. So again, this is recorded. There's some CME for those participating in the live hour here. We'll, uh, a link will be sent right afterwards to claim your CME. So thank you, everyone. We'll stay tuned on uh, Twitter and other social media. We'll try to share this uh, along the way. So thanks, everyone.